And we had it just right on this week, and we called a pastor on his birthday, so yeah, I got part of the blessings myself. <laughs> Name that tune. I make to the doctor. <laughs> and I've been around Baptist long enough. Long we live, the more trips we need to make to the book. Amen. Especially the book of Luke, because it's a doctor's book. Amen. And the doctor did write a book. Yeah. And I have been studying the book of Luke quite some time, and I have come to the conclusion that Luke writes like a doctor. Luke sees things like a doctor sees things. And he wrote just like a doctor. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he got to talking about Luke, he called him the beloved physician. Now I got to thinking about that, and I said, you know, normally a physician is not beloved until you need him. You don't give much thought to a doctor until you need one. And then he becomes one close friend. And I'm going to tell you, this book of Luke can sure be a friend. Amen. I'm in the first chapter, the first verse. Luke begins to write, and it's just like walking into the lobby of a doctor's office. Just like walking into that waiting room, fixing to go back into the exam. And so here we step into the lobby and he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order. Now that, that little phrase, in order, is a popular phrase to the book of Luke, to the doctor Luke. Because you see, a doctor does everything in order. You ever gone into a doctor's office? I mean, when you go into the vision, when you go into that little waiting room, everything's in order. When you go back there into the examining room, everything's in order. It's not like your house. I mean, in the doctor's office, everything's in order. And so, I don't know if you get like me, but I get back there in that examining room, you know, the nurse takes you in, she sits you down, and she leaves you. And you're sitting in there all by yourself. And I can't help it, but I start pulling them little drawers out. Because <laughs> I, I, I want to see what's in there. And the only thing that I can remember is everything in that drawer is in order. Yeah. I mean, everything is boxed and wrapped and, and the little wrappings, everything's in order. And, and, then, and then it really gets me and I start opening the cabinets. I can't help it. I, I'm always scared that they're going to catch me doing it. But to have a chair. But the one thing that I've noticed when I peek in them cabinets and look in them drawers, everything's in order. And that's the way it is with the book of Luke. If you know anything about the book of Luke, if you have read it from beginning to end, he put everything in order. Because that's just the way a doctor's going to do it. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order, a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning 
were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things which thou hast been instructed. Now only God and the Spirit of God sometimes can put a message together. I mean, I can put one together sometimes, but you know, it don't always do well. But on this particular day, when my morning devotion and my, my day began in the book of Luke, it just so happened that that day I had a doctor's visit. They coincide at the same time. So I had read that and then I, I went to the doctor and when I left the doctor's office and I started home, I said, you know something? I said, going to the doctor and the doctor's office, it's a whole lot like going to church. And the first thing that I begin to think about is when I went to that doctor's office, I the only way to get in there was to go through the front door. I had to go through the door to get in there. Now, if they would have caught me coming in the back door or crawling in the window, they'd have thought I was a thief. Yeah. But I had to come through the front door. And you know, when I go to church, I come through the front door. Yeah. Because if you catch me crawling in that window or coming in the back door, I'm going to look like a thief and a robber. And did you know heaven has not got but one door? Yeah, oh, I know there's a lot of religions, a lot of pulpits, there's a lot of, there's a lot of doctrines, but I'm telling you heaven has got one door. Yes, amen. Yeah, yeah. If you try to get in any other way, you're going to look like a thief and a robber. Yeah. Right. I walked into that doctor's office, and the first thing I did, I had to sign in. Because he wouldn't even know that I was there if I had to sign in. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't. I mean, he's back yonder doing his, doing his work. I'm sitting out there love. If I hadn't signed in, I'd still be sitting there. Yeah. You ever thought about coming into church and just signing in? <laughs> you see, the reason why I signed in is because I wanted that doctor to know I was there. Yeah. I mean, I went down there for a specific reason. And I wanted to see that doctor, and that doctor would never have known that I would have come into his office had I not walked up there and signed in. You ever thought about coming in the front door of the church and just kind of saying, Lord, I'm here. Yeah. And just kind of sign in with heaven. <laughs> just to let the Lord know I'm here. I sat down in the lobby like in that little room like everybody else and I looked around and everybody had a book in their hand. I mean, there's stacks of books everywhere. And everybody's sitting there with a book in their hand so I didn't want to be out of place so I got me a book and I was sitting there holding a book with them. And lo and behold, when I went down to the church house, I noticed everybody in there is holding a book. Yeah. They got a song book. They got the book. But then I got to thinking, I said, you know, there's one book that's at the doctor's office and the same books down to church. Check them. <laughs> You're not going to get in there and see that doctor without a checkbook. Yes, and how dare you come down to the house of God and see the Lord and not bring a checkbook. Yeah. I sat there and I, you know what I was waiting on? I was waiting on him to call my name. Yes. Yeah. I wanted him to call my name. Don't you want the Lord to call your name tonight? I mean, I don't know why you came. I hope it wasn't just to hear me. But if you came in like you was going to the doctor, surely you brought some need in your life that you would love for God yes. to deal with tonight. You see, I wanted them to call my name. And when you come to church, surely, surely, you want God, don't you? You want God to call your name. Because if he calls your name, that means you get to bring your troubles yeah. and your problems to him. I was sitting there, and sure enough, I sat there long enough, and all of a sudden that nurse came out, and she called my name. You talk about one happy boy. Because, see, I had a pain. I had a problem, and I needed to see that doctor. Yeah. 
And when she called my name, I was happy. When, I, when she called my name, I didn't look up at her and say, what do you want? I didn't even argue with her. I mean, I just got up and went forward. And if you want to hear God call your name tonight, you just get up and come forward. If you hear, and I'm going to tell you something, if God ever calls your name, you'll know it. I mean, in all that lobby, there was all kinds of us people sitting out there. But when she called my name, I knew it. Yes, I'm going to tell you down in the depths of your heart, if you've got a saved soul, God knows how to call your name. Yes, I went back, I went forward, and I went into that little examining room. And shortly the doctor come in and he asked me what was wrong. He wanted to know where I was hurt and why did I come. So I began to tell him my pain. I told him where my pain was and where my problem was. And whatever from that point on, everything that that doctor told me to do, I did. Yes. He said, take your shirt off. I didn't argue with him. I just took it off. Yeah. I mean, he said, take your pants off. I just take my pants off. I'm not going to argue with him. He said, stand over there in that corner. I, I just, I, I'm not saying, what do you want me over there for? What do you want me to take? I didn't argue with that doctor when he told whatever he told me to do. I just did it. And you know, sometimes God can tell you some strange things to do. But whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Amen. He took me, made me take my shirt off, and he put me behind that x-ray. Because you see, I look good on the outside. He could look at me and he couldn't see my problem. Because my problem was on the inside. And I look at you tonight and you're sitting there in your finest clothes and your hair is fixed and you got suits and shirts on and you, you took a shower and you combed your hair. You look good to me. I can't even see a problem. I can't see one troubled thing in your life. But you see the trouble's on the inside on the inside. He looked inside of me, put me behind that x-ray and he saw where my problem was and he saw what it was and he saw where it was. So he began to talk to me. While he talked to me, he pulls out this needle that's about an inch and a half long. And I'm listening to the words and watching that needle. And the next thing I know, he done picked up this can and went, and all of a sudden, that needle disappeared into my shoulder blade. It hurt going in, but I'm going to tell you, when it come out, I was feeling good. The pain was gone. It hurt coming, but it sure felt good going. And that's kind of like coming to church and hearing a sermon. I mean, if you hadn't been doing right, you hadn't been living right, you've been a little lazy on the Lord, it might hurt going in, but it'll feel good coming out. Amen. Pain stopped. I got what I came for. Yes. And I went home happier than I was when I came. Amen. I was hurting on my way down there, but I was feeling good going home. Yes. You ever been to you ever come to church hurting? Yeah. You ever come to church with just a problem? Yeah. And somehow the grace of God gave you the hope or the help. And you walked out a lot better than you came. Yes, sir. And if you ever complain about the price that it costs to go to a doctor, then you have never hurt bad enough. That's right. Because if you ever hurt, you don't care. You'll mortgage the farm. Yeah. You are going to get rid of that pain because we can't handle the pain. Amen. You see, Luke is a physician. He's a doctor. He writes like a doctor. Theophilus, in the very beginning, is the patient. The doctor is writing to this patient and the whole book of Luke is the prescription. And what the doctor is saying to the patient, he said, I, I'm going to write to you in order a prescription, Theophilus, of things that we most surely believe because we got perfect understanding. And if you'll just do the things that I write on this prescription, you'll be all right. A lot of times God writes us a prescription, but we just throw it away and we don't take the medicine that he gives. Do you know there's just something about us? I don't know what it is about human beings, but we're just given to trust doctors. Yeah. 
Whatever a doctor tells us, we accept it. Whatever a doctor advises us to do, we just do it. He says take this, and we just take it. If he says take it three times a day, I mean, heaven and earth, you just move it aside, we're going to take that pill three times a day. If he says start doing this, we just start doing it. If he says you need to stop doing that, we just stop doing it. If he says you need to walk three miles a day, and we just start walking three miles a day. If he says quit eating cheesecake on Monday nights, and you just quit eating. <laughs> But whatever that doctor tells you to do, we just do it. We don't even ask questions. We just do it. We trust him. We accept the diagnosis. If he gives us medicine, he said, take this medicine, and, and we'll, we'll, I mean, we're going to buy it. We're going to pay the cost. We're going to get that medicine, and we're going to take it just like the prescription says. We trust doctors with our personal problems. We'll tell doctors things that we won't tell nobody else. I sat there in that doctor's office and I've been in doctor's office where we talked about things and I ain't going to talk to you about that. Yeah. But we trust him with our personal problems. We'll trust the doctor with our physical problems. We'll, we'll let a doctor look at us when we won't let nobody else look. We let a doctor examine us and we're not going to let nobody else examine us. We'll let a doctor look inside of us. I'm just not going to let anybody look inside of me. We'll go so far to let a doctor listen inside of us. I don't want nobody else listening inside of me. We'll go so far to let a doctor probe inside of us. He's looking for something. And if he finds it early and he catches it, you'll live longer. I wonder why it is we can't trust Jesus like we trust the doctor. I mean, if Jesus gives us a diagnosis and tells us, I wonder why we can't believe it. If he says you ought to do this three times a day, I wonder why we have such a hard time doing it three times a day. If he, if he says, look, you want some good medicine is, you need to get along once a day and pray. I wonder why we have a hard time. He, you need to read your Bible three times a day for ten minutes. I wonder why we'd have a hard time doing that. You need to trust Jesus with your personal problems. You can trust him. You, you can pull up and tell him things that you wouldn't tell nobody else. You can unburden your heart and say it any way you want to. Describe it any way you want to. But just trusting with your personal problems. Trusting with your physical problems. Just, just kind of open up your heart. Get along, just kind of open up that heart and just say, Lord, would you, would you look down inside of me? You, you might find something inside of me that you, you need to remove before it becomes cancerous. Yeah. Well, Lord, would you just kind of, would you just kind of put your ear up to my heart and listen? Would you just listen? Lord, would you probe? Would you probe inside of me, Lord? You see, when we go to a doctor like that, we, we get better. We get healthier. We live longer. And if we'll come to the Lord like that, I'm telling you, you'll do better. You'll live longer. You'll, do, you'll be a lot healthier. What Luke's trying to do, he's trying to put Theophilus at ease. You know, a doctor has a way of just kind of calming you when you're all full of anxiety and, and, and you're in a panic because you think you're fixing to die. And a doctor's just got a way of just saying, hey, it's going to be all right. And that's the way Luke approaches Theophilus. Hey, I'm certain of these things, Theophilus. I, I got perfect understanding. You, you can trust me. I'm certain. And in the very beginning, Dr. Luke is trying to calm all the anxieties and the fears of old Theophilus. He says, Theophilus, it just seems good to me. Doesn't that sound like a doctor? It just seems good to me. And, and 
And do know this, Theophilus. I got perfect understanding. Don't you wish you could find a doctor that had perfect understanding? Instead of, instead of being a guinea pig with 15 different kinds of medicines, you know, and I mean, just found a doctor that's got perfect understanding. You can tell him one time and he knows exactly what to do. Jesus is saying, hey, I got perfect understanding. I'm certain of these things. It, it just seems good to me. I know what you need. Jesus is saying to us because I've got perfect understanding. I, I know what your life needs because I've got perfect understanding. I, I, know, I know what your heart needs because I've got perfect understanding. That's what Jesus is saying to us. I know, I know what your faith needs because I got perfect understanding. You know what Paul says about faith? He says, exercise your faith. Did you know when you go to a doctor today, the first thing he says is, you're overweight. Your beach needs to get, you need to start exercising. That's the last thing we want to hear, but that's the first thing he tells you, start exercising. And so what happens, we start exercising and then we feel worse after we get through exercising than we did before we started. Because we're exercising muscles that we haven't been using. God steps into our life sometimes and begins to exercise our faith. And it hurts. Because we're starting to use muscles that we haven't used before. I know what your faith needs. I got perfect understanding. I know what your future needs. I know what, you don't know what you need tomorrow. But Jesus said, I, I know what your future needs because I've got perfect understanding. I know what your pain needs. I've got perfect understanding. I know what your family needs. I know what you need. I've got perfect understanding. Luke is trying to tell Theophilus, trust me, just trust me. And when you go to a doctor, you've got to trust him. I got perfect understanding. Is it bad, Doc? Oh, I've seen worse cases than yours. The office, I was with a guy named Paul over in, in Philippi. We ran into an old boy over there. The jailer, and I'm telling you, he's got, you talk about one bad case. I, I was with Paul when we run across this man, and I'm telling you, it's one of the worst cases I've ever seen. This man was the most angriest man I've ever witnessed in my life. This man was abusive. This man was ruthless. This man was hateful. This man was merciless. And he wasn't just like that on the job. You should have seen him at home. He was the same way with the wife and the children. He just brought it to work. He beat everybody to work. But I'm telling you, I saw a miracle cure upon that man. And I'm telling you, when he got cured, he become one of the most kindest and gentlest and sweetest men that man you ever met in your life. Why he became so he changed so much and was cured so much. He he brought us. He took them into the house and washed their uh, pains and and uh, scrubbed them down. Uh, listen, though Paul would have died of an infection had it not been for the change in the jailer's heart when he took him home and he cleansed him wounds that those beatings and those chains had made in him. And then when he got through, he made him a big supper. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about a change. I mean, you talk about one changed man. Yeah. Amen. So what Luke is saying, Theophilus, I've seen a lot worse cases than you got. So whatever problem you have tonight, know this. There's been people that's brought worse cases than you've got to the Lord and had them cured. So. Amen. No matter what problem you brought in your heart, in your home, in your life, whatever problem it is, God has done cured a lot worse cases than this. Isn't that encouraging? Yeah. Yeah. Luke wrote a prescription. He said, follow my instructions. And if you do what I tell you, your survival rate will go up. Sometimes people come into the church and they come in with only a 30% chance of survival. Their home only has a 30% chance of making it. Their marriage only has a 30% chance of even making it. But if they'll do what Luke prescribed in his Bible, in his letter, can I tell you your survival rate will go up 100%? Yes, sir. If you'll yeah. just do what the prescription says. The word certainty there in the beginning of Luke's 
Bible, Luke's letter, is, it's the only time in the Bible that it's used and only a doctor uses it. Certainty. You can go through the book of Luke and I think that word certain shows up 43 times. I think it shows up six times in the book of Matthew, like five times in the book of Mark, and uh, just, a, just a half a dozen times in John. But that word certain shows up 43 times in the book of Luke because certain means a fact. And every time Luke says something, every time, when you read it, look at it. Every time he uses, every time he mentions something, he talks about a certain man, a certain day, a certain ship, a certain place. Because it's a fact to the doctor. That's just the way a doctor looks at that. Yeah. The physician wanted him to know, I'm, I'm certain. I'm certain of your condition. I'm certain of the cause of your problem, and I am certain that there is a cure. So here's what Luke does, and we won't be able to look at all of them, but we'll look at some of them. In the book of Luke, when Luke looks at the Lord Jesus, he always saw him as a physician. The word physician is used more times in the book of Luke than any other book of the Bible. Stands the reason that the doctor wrote it, huh? And so I want you to look with me in Luke chapter 4. Because I want you to see the first time that Luke looks at the Lord Jesus and sees him as a physician. I'm in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, and I begin reading in verse number 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wonder at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. So what picture we have, here is Jesus. He's stepping out of that carpenter shop. And when Jesus stepped out of that carpenter shop, can I tell you, God stepped into our world. Yeah. And when God stepped into our world, the first thing he did, he went down to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That's just like when you get saved. You might not have, you know, church might not even be in your habits of life, but when you get saved, there's just something in there that wants to go down to the church. Amen. And it's the same way with our Lord. When he steps out, the first thing he does, he goes down to the church. He goes down to the synagogue, and he comes into the synagogue, and he, when he walks in, there's all these people sitting there just like we are tonight. They're sitting there, a congregation, and he walks in, and what is sitting before him is a representative of all of humanity. He walks in, and he looks over the crowd, and the brokenhearted are there. People whose lives have been brokenhearted. They've been brokenhearted over children. They've been brokenhearted over death of loved ones. They've been brokenhearted over uh, problems in marriages and lives, brokenhearted over moms and dads, just whatever in life would break your heart. Jesus looked out there and there sat the brokenhearted. He looked out and there sat the blind. He saw those people that were too blind to see the need for the church, too blind to see the beauty of the scriptures, too blind to see a need of God. They just sat there blind. He looked out upon him, and there sat those that were bound up in sin, who had came into the synagogue that, that were chained and addicted to some sin and they could not get free. Yeah. They were sitting there, and they had all kinds of, of vices and sinful addictions that they had tried every way in the world to break free and couldn't do it. So there sat the bound. There sat the blind. There sat the brokenhearted. There sat the bruised. 
Those that had been bruised by the troubles of life, bruised by the trials of life, bruised, hurt, there they all sit. And Jesus walks in and looks upon them and they all look like patience to him. They look like patience because they were all sitting there listening. They were all sitting there wandering. They were all sitting there wanting something. And he looks out upon them and they look like a church that needed a preacher. He looked out upon them and they looked like a hospital that needed a physician. He looked out upon them and they looked like a wreck that needed a paramedic. He looked out upon them and they looked like wounded soldiers that needed a medic to bring them a blood transfusion. He looked out upon them and they looked like an emergency room that needed a nurse. He looked out upon them and they looked like a ward that needed a psychiatrist. He looked out upon them and looked like a mission field that needed a missionary. He looked out and they all looked helpless. Like they were just needing and wanting somebody. And so all of a sudden the preacher steps in and there they all sit. And he steps up before them and he picks up a book. And he opens up this book and he begins to speak. And he said, the Spirit of God is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Do you know what that meant? That meant when you've got a gospel and you've got the Spirit of God and you've got that anointing upon that man, do you know what that means? That means that the power is there to help the brokenhearted. When that man stands up with the anointing of God upon him and the Spirit of God's in that place, that means that the presence of God is there to help whatever problem you brought in. The power is there. The presence is there. Uh, the, the privilege to be able to sit in a church where the Spirit of God is and the Word of God and an anointed preacher. Can I tell you how rare that is in America? Can I tell you people go to church all, sometimes all their lives, Sunday after Sunday, and they do not know what it's like to sit before a man that stands up there that's got the power of God upon him? Do you know the rare privilege that we have to sit in a service where the anointing of God is there? Amen. And when he stepped into that pulpit and looked out upon that crowd, the broken heart and the bruise and the blind and the bound, can I tell you the power of God was there to help everybody whose heart was broken, yes. to help that one who was bound up in sin, to help that blind one open his eyes, to help that bruise with, with the troubles and trials of life. That's why we come to church. Yes. It's like coming to the doctor. We bring those problems in and we present them waiting for the power of God to come help you. You see, the gospel, everybody knows that the gospel is good news. That's what it means. You know how, you know how we are. If we've got a problem, it's always the worst there ever been. That it's not even written in the medical journals of history. <laughs> if we've got a pimple, we swear it's a tumor. If we got a rash, it's skin cancer. If we got indigestion, it's a heart attack. And we go to the doctor and we know we've only got three days to live. We go down there and we drag in. And Doc, I'm just not going to make it. What's your problem? Well, I've been eating alive. The doc looks at it and he said, I've got good news. It's just poison ivy. And that, that, that pimple there on the side of your neck, I, let me pop it. That's good news. You're going to live anyway. And, and that indigestion, take a tag of it. That's just that chili that you ate yesterday. You ain't got a heart attack. You're going to live. Hey, that's good news. Yeah. When you go in there thinking you're dying and the doctor said you're going to live, that's good news. Can I tell you, when you come to church with all your problems and the preacher gets up and preaches, hey, that's good news. You can make it. I don't care how broken your heart is and bound up you are, I'm telling you, you can make it. Yes. This chapter proves that Jesus wasn't an independent Baptist. <laughs> because the Bible said he spoke to them with gracious words. <laughs> I tell you, an independent Baptist would have walked in there 
saw them bound up and blind and said, bless God, you bunch of heathen, I'm fixing to put you in hell. <laughs> Jesus looked out upon that crowd with gracious words. Gracious words are words that are full of hope and power. That even while he's preaching, you can feel the hope and the power of that servant. You can feel it. Gracious words are words that are marked with kindness. You got to mark with kindness. So. Gracious words are words that are imparting grace. That even while you're sitting there listening, you can feel that grace of God just, I mean, somehow lifted and helping and strengthened. Gracious words are are words that are painful words that's been sterilized with grace. Sometimes the doctor's got to do something that hurts. Sometimes he's got to give you a shot. And the shot hurts. But if he doesn't sterilize that needle, you can get an infection. It's a lot worse than a disease. And sometimes preaching, if it's not got grace on it, it can hurt you. I've been, I, we all have been there. I mean, if it's not, if that sermon, if that needle, if that is not sterilized in grace, it can hurt. But you can take something painful from the book, sterilize it with grace, and it'll help. It won't hurt. There's nothing like a doctor when you're hurting. I mean, when you're hurting, you don't turn to the wife. She can't help you. I mean, when you're hurting, you don't look to the husband. You say, hey, get me to a doctor. There's nothing like a doctor when you hurt. My wife and I was we had preached in Alabama. We were coming, we were heading back home. And we stopped off in uh, in Hammond, Louisiana, at a, at a old Cajun's church down there. And I called, told him I was coming, and, and he told he called all of his people and said, uh, "Brother Dan's coming." So there was about a half a dozen of them that came, and they had the flu. They came in with fever, and you could see the fever on. Them. And they, and they come up and they hugged me. And when they walked away, I looked and it was on me. They left the fever on me. I wish they'd have stayed home, but they didn't. And so by the time I preached and had that Cajun crud on me, I had that Louisiana bug. By the time we got home, six hours later, you talk about sick. That fever was setting in. That cough was setting in, and I was, I felt horrible. Called my pastor, told him I couldn't make it to church. I was feeling so bad. So me and my wife were sitting at the table. We both we both got it. We both got fever. We both coughing. We both feel horrible. And so we, we're trying to cheer each other up, and we got to laughing. Now I had been coughing for three days, and I got to laughing so hard I, I cracked a rib. I don't know if you've ever cracked a reel, but I fell out of my chair on the kitchen floor. And I'm down yonder. I am, I'm hurting. Well, I'm going to tell you, you better hope that you're not married to a school teacher. 31 years of teaching in school has a, has a numbing effect on sympathy. <laughs> my wife looks at me and she said, all right, get up. You're all right. I couldn't get up. I'm telling you, I hurt. She finally, you know, I bent and she struggled and we finally got, she got me in the car and she took me down to the ER, to Northwest Medical Center and I couldn't even get out of the car. They had to bring the stretcher and the wheelchair and, and they got me out of the car and they took me and they brought me in the ER and they set me down and I sat in that ER for seven hours. Seven hours I'm hurting in that lobby before I could ever get back behind there. I used to not believe in UFOs. I used to not believe that there was, you know, alien life somewhere. But I'm telling you, there are. And the landing pad is an emergency room. They beam it in and out. If you've never sat in an ER for seven hours, you you, you don't need sci-fi. You can jump that channel, go to ER. You want to see some creatures? I mean, they come in there with every kind of hairdo. They had antennas coming out their ears and their eyebrows and their tongue and their nose holes. I mean, them antennas were beaming on something. Because I looked at their feet, they floated in and floated out. They never touched the ground. I watched them. 
I see more belly buttons. I see more tattoos of snakes crawling out from under their bridges. I'm telling you, you, you ain't never seen nothing like that. And I sat there for seven hours watching that in pain, watching these space creatures coming in and out, beating up. And finally, they took me in the back. I got back out and he saw how much I was hurting and he reached over and got him a syringe and got him about 20 cc's of morphine and hit me and I went, whoa, that's the grace of God. <laughs> Son, I ain't felt that good since I got saved. <laughs> Yeah, you are hurting. You get you a good shot of morphine, son. I mean, you talk about feeling good. My wife said, I started saying things I ain't never said. <laughs> I started seeing things I ain't never seen either. I tell you, there ain't nothing like a doctor when you're hurting. Hey, nothing like a Lord when you got a problem. Boy, you talk about more, you talk about that heavenly morphine. I'm telling you, the grace of God, it, it can help, it, it, can, it can somehow give, give a healing to that problem, give a help uh, to that problem. Ain't nothing like a doctor when you hurt. Nothing like Jesus when you hurt. So here's the pity of it all. They sat there, he said, the Spirit of God's on me. The anointing of God's upon me. And, the, and he had the gospel to preach to the poor. And here's the pity. They looked at him and they said, Hey, physician, why don't you just heal yourself? Well, you're talking about sad. That was a man that had all the power to hell. They said, Heal yourself. We're not as bad as you say we are. We're not as sinful as you seem to say we are. We're not as sick as you preach. We're not as blind and broken and bound up as you seem to say we are. We don't need you telling us how to live. We don't need you telling us what we need to do to better ourselves. And the power was present to help every problem of the But they wouldn't come and get it. You talk about Whatever's broken your heart, whatever blindness you have, whatever's got you bound, whatever bruise there is in life, can I tell you the presence of God is here tonight to help? Yeah, it is. It's here to help. And, and surely, surely we've all got at least one problem that we would love God to deal with. Yeah. I, I'm going to try to take a little bit more time, if you let me. Look in Luke chapter 5, and let me give you the second time that that Luke sees Jesus as a physician. In, in, the, in the fifth chapter, in verse number 29, and Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why? You know something I've learned? Did you know every time that the Pharisees in the Bible start talking to the Lord, they always say, why? Yeah. That's the first question. That's the first word that comes out of the Pharisees' mouth. Why? Why y'all got to go to church three times a week? Why, why y'all got to read that Bible all the time? Why y'all got to go to Why? 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 Did you know why is pretty close to whining like a baby? Yeah. <laughs> it's close. And every time they come up, they always, why? Why y'all got to do this? Why y'all got to do that? Pharisees. So they said, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. See what Matthew had done. Matthew had just got saved. When Matthew got saved, he threw the front doors of his house open. He told his cooks, He said, Cook up a meal. And he put word out everywhere. Come to Matt, come to my house, come to Matthew's house. You can get a feast. And so here, everybody come. Everybody's in for a free meal, man. Yeah. You want to get people to church? You put it out for a buffet at the Victory Baptist Church. Yeah. They'll be here. And this is what Matthew done. Matthew threw that feast, and here they all come. Hey, there's something about home. Now, I, me, me and my wife, we travel all over the country, and you don't always get home cooking. A lot of times, we, I'm not 
Plus, I'm not complaining about restaurant food, but I'm telling you, ain't nothing like home cooking. Yes. Yeah. Ain't nothing like it. And when these publicans and these sinners heard that they could get some, I mean, they've been eating out of trash cans, they've been eating out the rescue mission, and when they found out they could get some home cooking, here they come. Yeah. And then publicans and sinners, they don't know how to live right, but they do know how to eat right. I had a rescue mission. I, I built a little street church in downtown Houston for 16 years. We, took, we had a meal every Sunday. And, and the first Sunday of every month was called Hot Dog Sunday. And you know something? I found out there's something divine about a hot dog. I always had my biggest crowds on Hot Dog Sunday. And I said to myself, it's my preaching that's bringing them in here. There's got to be that preaching. Nah, nah it's that dog. The, our ladies in the church would make up 300 Texas chili dogs. You ever heard of, you ever, you ever listen to a weenie on the grill? <laughs> it just sounds heavenly. They would bring them, they would bring that fresh bread in there and them weenies, they would, they would put them on. We had a little flat top grill and they'd put them on that grill. Now I'm trying to preach and these weenies are going, Shh. And then they grate. I mean, we didn't, didn't, we didn't buy cheap, cheap, cheap cheese. They grated that cheese. And they would grate the onions. And they would cook up pots of chili. And I'm telling you, you talk about some boys that love to eat. You've never lived until you see 200 winos eat chili dogs. Yeah. They, they, would, they would sit there with that plate. That chili would run down between their fingers. It'd run down their beards. They would look up at me and I'd, say, I'd walk by and I'd say, how's that? They'd look up at me with three teeth. And I'm telling you, chili would just fly everywhere. And, and, they, and I know it, it would get in her beard and then keep it for a snack. Yeah. <laughs> I know they would. I'm telling you, you talk about, you talk about the grace of God. I'm telling you, I felt God's presence in the midst of 200 wide O's hey, eating chili dogs. Amen. Here are these bums, here are these publicans and sinners are in Matthew's house eating all these chili dogs. And these Pharisees are coming up to the windows and they're looking in. And they're driving by. And they, they look in there and you don't want to spoil a good time. It's a Pharisee. Yeah. He, I, I'm telling you, the Lord can be having the best time of his life and a Pharisee can just ruin it. Yeah. And a Pharisee comes up to the front door and he looks in there and he says, why, why are they in there? Why are you public and sinners fellowshipping with that man? I'm glad I don't need him like you do. Yeah. Well, why are you going in that house? I'm glad I'm not that hungry. Why are you eating on that food? I thank God I don't eat that kind of food. Why, why is Jesus in there with them people? I'm glad I'm not that simple. I'm glad I'm not that stupid. Why are they laughing so much? I take life serious. I don't laugh that much. Well, well look at some of them people in there. Some of them are divorced. Good God Almighty. So some of them in there, they got some of them in there got dogs and cats in the house. And then I had a guy preaching the other day, put me in hell having a cat. I'm going to tell you, you ever had a cat like my Garfield? You, you'd think different about cats. Yeah. I'm telling you, about a couple of years ago, we, somebody just dumped a yellow cat out in, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood, and it lived under everybody's bushes. It got in the awful fight one time, and it crawled up on my front porch, and its side was ripped open, and its guts was hanging out. And my wife would put a little food down there, and it wouldn't let you touch it. And if you ever looked at it, you wouldn't want to touch it. His ears are gnawed off. His lips all chewed up. He's got teeth missing. Got a two-inch tail. And he's got two big fangs like a saber-toothed tiger that hang down there like that. Finally, she, you know, she fed it. And old Garfield, he nursed himself to health. And I got up one morning at 6 o'clock, go out there and open my door to let me go and get the newspaper. And when I opened that door, Garfield just sitting there. And he just walked in. <laughs> I mean, something look that bad, I'm not going to kick him out. I'm not going to stick my foot down there. <laughs> so he walked in, and honestly, he walked in, and he looked in the living room, and he looked down the hall, and he looked up at me, and he turned, and he just walked out. 
The next morning, I got up, six o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get my newspaper, I opened the door, and there's Sister Garfield. Garfield walked in, he ain't left yet. He's still there. He rules the house. He gets up in bed with us. He sleeps between us. He's got him a pillow. We're talking about a homeless cat. You say, kick him out. Hey, you come kick him out. I ain't messing with him. If he won't sleep by bed, he can sleep by bed. You look at something like that, you let him sleep too. He'll, he'll get up there, he'll, 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 he'll gnaw on your feet, and he'll take you to the bathroom. He don't like water in a bowl. He wants it running from the faucet. And he hops up there, and you've got to turn the faucet on. If you don't stand there and, and watch him until he finishes, you'll forget it's on and come back the next day with a $50 water bill. And, and, and we tried to give him cheap cat food. He didn't cheap cat food. He didn't fancy fees. 50 cents a can, $2 a day. 60 bucks a month. That's why I gotta preach. That's why I need offerings. I gotta feed my cat. Hey, but I'm telling you, they put up to they said the other day that the cats are demon possessed. Well, I'm gonna tell you something about Garfield. Now, he done whoop every dog in the neighborhood. There's not one dog that'll come in my yard. You know what they do when they come in the yard, don't you? They come in, they leave something, and they go. Garfield won't let him come up in my yard. He sits out on the front porch like the Phoenix in Egypt. <laughs> you know, he just sits there with his ears stuck up there and his tail popped up. Ain't nobody going to come up in there and mess with him. He, he, listen, he allows what cat he wants to even come up in our yard. I've seen him run something on Tabby's off. And then Pharisee said, look inside there. Some of them people got dog cats in the house. I wish they'd come over to my house. I'd sit Garfield on. <laughs> Look at them people there. Some of the dumbest people in town. Some of them dead. They all depressed. Some are dumb. Wonder why? You know why Jesus can't help some people? Because they never see nothing wrong with themselves, yes. and they see everything wrong with somebody else. Yes, he can't help it kind of people. There's some people who will not go to the doctor. They just won't go. I, all day long, my wife asked me, she said, what, what message are you going to preach now? And I said, I don't know. She said, how will you know? I said, I'm looking for a sign. So we're standing there in the back, you know, and old Crip comes in on his crutches. And, and the pastor from Detroit, he's standing there and he makes a statement. He says, I wonder why it is some men have a hard time going to the doctor. And I said, well, I know what I'm preaching tonight. <laughs> I got two other messages. I didn't know what I was going to do, but thank God I got the right one. There's some people, they won't go to a doctor. You got to shove them, push and beat them. They won't go because they don't want to know what the problem is. Isn't that stupid? If I go to the doctor, he'll tell me what's wrong with me. What, what, duh. That's why you go to the doctor. So he'll tell you what's wrong with you. There's some people who say, if I go down there, he'll tell me there's something wrong. So they won't go. And some people won't go to a doctor because they, they don't want any they don't want anybody else to know there's something wrong with them. Yeah. If they go, people are going to see. They won't go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And some people won't go to the doctor because they're not going to pay the price. They won't pay it. They'll stay home and hurt and hurt. They're not paying that price. And some people won't go because they're not going to stop what they're doing. They got other things more important. They won't go to the doctor. There's some people think that if they just ignore the symptoms, they'll just go away. That's what they think. They don't even realize that it's getting worse all the time. There's some people just too embarrassed to go. Won't go. But you know, there's always that other crowd that will go for anything. I mean, if they if, if their toenail hurts, they're going. If their ear hurts, they're going. I mean, that dog, every time he looks up, here they come. They want to live longer. They want to feel better. They want to enjoy the family. They want to enjoy life. So they keep coming to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some people that will live, do right. They just keep coming. Piano yeah, friend, would you come? They just keep coming. Can I, can I give you this question? What if tonight you felt like the Lord was here and you came and you've got one, one problem 
that you would love to just bring to the great position. Say, Lord, could you help me with this? If you thought tonight that he could help you, would you bring it to him? Play something soon. Would you bow your heads? Whatever problem you might have, if you felt like tonight that we had that rare privilege of sitting underneath the anointing gospel, and you thought tonight if you brought it, he could do something about it. Lord, I got this problem. My heart's breaking. Lord, I, I've got something I sure am blind. I need to see it better. Lord, I, I've got this vice. I've got this sin. I can't get away from it. Tell him your personal problems. Tell him like you would a doctor. Lord, this is what it is. This is how bad it hurts. Could you help me with it? Would you look down inside of it? Could you just help Thank you. 